Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Let me screen share. All right, can everybody see that? Yeah, okay, good. So um, Wei Chen asked me to try to do this in like 20 minutes or so, and you'll see it's, there's a lot to this. Um, and I also wanna start off by saying that most, if not all of this comes from God and the Gay Christian. It's a book by Matthew Vines. I highly recommend it if you're new to the subject, especially um, just has a lot of really great information to get started with. And then at the end, I do have um, like another resource slide for you. So if you need more books or if there's websites or something that you wanna look through, I have that there. And I believe Wei Jin is gonna send out the slides afterwards to make them available somehow. So this will be provided to you. You don't have to take notes or anything, you'll get it. <laughs> All right, so. Okay, so there are six clobber passages. I've listed them here. Um, a couple of them are gonna be bunched up together when we discuss them later on, but these are basically the six that um, people refer to when talking about the issue of homosexuality and whether or not that's a sin. And more often than not, these passages have been used to sort of condemn uh, homosexuality and uh, people who identify as queer or maybe gender non-conforming or anything of the like there. So getting started with, with Genesis here, I'm just gonna read our highlighted verse so we can get through everything without taking too much time, but I do have the context verses up as well. But the main one we're gonna talk about is um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So I'll start in that last box. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, surrounded the house and called to Lot, where are the men who arrived tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. So in the English translation, it seems pretty straightforward and uh, just right out there, right? But we have to go further to figure out what this actually means. And then there's like translation concerns. We'll touch on that later when we get to Corinthians and Timothy. All right. So uh, this is talking about the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, that's in Genesis 19 for those who want to look that up. Um, and then I think our next one's gonna be yeah, we're going to go into Leviticus after that. So it's these angels who have come uh, into, I believe it's Sodom, and they had spent time with Abraham prior to that, and they were at Lot, and just for context, Lot is related to Abraham. Um, and when, after the angels had arrived there, Lot um, provided them a lot of hospitality. They, he brought them in, um, provided whatever they needed for them. But the men of the town um, wanted to come and basically harass them. So a lot of it here is about sexual desire um, or otherwise gang rape or attempted assault here. Um, and yeah, so like it's that assault factor that we're looking at here. And if we look at the passage, I realized I didn't actually put all of that in there. So yeah, um, earlier in chapter 19, Lot welcomed them in, bowed their bowed with his face to the ground. My Lord, he said, come to my home to wash your feet, yada, yada. And then um, after Lot's insistence, they stayed with him. He prepared the feast and all of that. And then we get to uh, that verse five where the men from the town wanted to come and assault them there. After trying to um, appease the city town or city folk with his daughters, and that's a whole other issue. We don't, we're not gonna get into that. Um, Lot offered his, his virgin daughters to the men instead of these angels out of uh, hospitality here. So we're focusing in on that hospitality. And if you look at other verses um, related to 
uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah passage. It's focusing on oppression, murder, and theft. It's focusing on injustices. It's focusing on basically everything except for an actual sexual sin here, despite the fact that it's gay, right? You know what I mean? So we're talking about that hospitality. Um, here's a couple of examples. So in Jeremiah, uh, referring back to Sodom and Gomorrah, is talking about that, um, like adultery, idolatry, power abuses, the false prophets, and refers them to Sodom. Um, Lamentations describes Jerusalem's fall to Babylon, Babylon as worse than Sodom. And then Amos and Zephaniah uh, describes God's punishment of those who oppress the poor similarly to Sodom. So any of those older ref or later references are referring back to Sodom as oppression and um, idolatry, adultery, things like that. Uh, Ezekiel here, uh, this one's pr like pretty plain and clear to see. Uh, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore I did away from them as you have seen. So again, it's looking at context here and mistranslations. So a lot of Sodom and Gomorrah's issues were the arrogancy, um, oppressing the poor, idolatry, and just overall like sinfulness, not necessarily a homosexual behavior. And I, I, maybe I should say like a sexual orientation as well, because homosexual is somewhat of an outdated word. That's again, also another conversation where we're so badly focused. Um, so if we're talking about a sexual orientation, like two people of the same gender or outside the gender binary having a committed loving relationship with each other. Um, moving on to Leviticus, we have two laws here. Uh, I'll just read all of that. Red, um, red, so I'm sorry. Are, mm -hmm. are we? Can, are we allowed to ask questions? I mean, or do you want to just go through it and then have time for questions at the end? Yeah, um, I think Wajin built in some time, but if there's anything like really pressing, I don't know if I can put up my chat. Um, yeah, no, uh, I yeah, can wait to the end. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. we have a conversation after the presentation. Yeah. Okay. But if you want to, be, if you have a quick question or no. ask for some clarification, that will be asked right now. So I, I think I just well, your email I want to know. question and answer at the end. Yeah, the question and answer will be the very end. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll keep my chat up so if there's anything like pressing or if I'm speaking too fast or whatnot, I'll try to keep an eye on that. Okay, let's go here. Okay, so Leviticus 18. Uh, you must not give any of your children to off or wait. Yeah, sorry. You must not give any of your children to offer them over to Molech so that you do not defile God's name. I am the Lord. You must not have sexual intercourse with a man as you would with a woman. It is a detestable practice. You will not have sexual relations with any animal by becoming or becoming unclean by it, nor will a woman present herself to an animal to mate with it. It is a perversion. And then Leviticus 20 on the other side of the page there. Uh, if a man has sexual intercourse with his daughter-in-law, both of them must be executed. They have acted perversely. Their, their blood is on their own heads. If a man has sexual intercourse with a woman, the two of them have done something detestable. They must be executed. Their blood is on their own hands. Um, and there's like another uh, law kind of related to that there. All right, um, so the first thing that Vines specifically points out when he's uh, writing this book is that all of the Old Testament laws were fulfilled through Christ. Um, and the reference there is Romans 10, 4, um, and then also Galatians 5, 1, Christ has set us free. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So we look at all the other laws. Um, again, if I go back here to our um, the text um leviticus 20 12 that law has been fulfilled and same for 13 and 14 right like christ has has fulfilled all of the law of the torah and then um there's 
uh, Philo, or Philo, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I think he was like a historian or an old, like, I don't know if I would want to say theologian, I don't think that really happened until later, but he condemned homosexuality um, or that kind of sleeping with the same gender as a form of pederasty, um, which is like, uh, not quite prostitution, but they're like related. And it's usually like an older gentleman with a young boy or something like that. Um, and there's very much like a power dynamic in that situation. And we, he talks about that a lot as well, about it being evil because males might suffer the affliction of being treated like a woman. Um, there's also a lot of context on gender roles uh, in these texts. So women, uh, and we see this today, like women are considered weak or fragile, lesser, um, not as intelligent and so forth. And males are considered to be strong, powerful, the head of the household, um, powerful, things like that. So the issue that Philo is talking about here is treating a man with lesser value and women just had that lesser value. So equating a man to a woman in this, in this case is removing some of that like honor value to the man. And that's what's the issue here in the form of pedastry. Uh, if I got those notes there. So yeah, a lot of these Leviticus laws are, yeah, about, um, like after being like fulfilled by Christ and um, just the, the different ways that they saw sleeping with the same gender. I don't really wanna use the term homosexuality even though it's, it's an easy word to use. Um, that term didn't even exist back in the time that these texts were created. So they didn't have that concept. They don't have the concept of sexual orientation as we do today. So we have to take context from um, the age that this is written and uh, moving forward again. Sorry, this is fast as well. There's lots of text to cover um, and not as much time to get to it all. So Romans 1, 6, uh, 1 26 through 27. Again, I'll read all of that here. That's why God abandoned them to degrading lust. Their females traded natural sexual relations for unnatural sexual relations. Also in the same way, the males traded sexual, natural sexual relations with females and burned with lust for each other. Males performed shameful acts with males and they were paid back the penalty they deserved for their mistakes with their own bodies. All right, so this one is the largest passage on the topic. Um, and the main issues here that Vines talks about a lot is um, like, that we have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. So in context with where that is in Romans, that's where we're at in the book. So um, if you've read that section before, there's lots, I mean, that's where Romans 3.23 um, comes from. That's pretty popular and famous. And it just talks about the depravity that we have as sinful creatures and then moves into God's redemption after that. Um, there's also a lot of idolatry towards other gods. Uh, we're just going to read this quote here from Vines. Turning away from God, the Gentiles worship idols instead of God um, and let them go, allowing them to experience the consequences of life without them. So that could involve any sorts of um, different sins going on. So uh, verses 24 and 25. Let me pull this up too. Again, sorry, this is so fast. <laughs> Okay, I'm not quite on the right page there. Um, yeah, so, uh, I, sorry, I don't wanna take up too much time looking for this passage here, but yeah, it's um, like when God let them go to have the consequences of their sin, it was a lot of like that desire, the lust that they had. So um, it was about like overindulgence almost. So in that pedastry form, 
um, that would be like an overindulgence because most of the men who were engaged in that might have already had female partners, but they were going above and beyond and trying to get that from somebody that was possibly like unnatural for them or was out of a sense of lust or desire. And my next one here. So uh, again, this idea of natural and unnatural. Um, John Boswell is a historian that Vines mentions and his big focus on this passage was about people who could like engage in heterosexual practices um, and still find like pleasure and enjoyment from that. So the people who are engaging in this lust and over exultion or over consumption of sexual pleasure is people who were also in some sense like heterosexually oriented, but could find pleasure on like same sex or homosexual, gay, whatever you want to call it, pleasures. Um, and again, sexual orientation was not a concept here at this time. They weren't, they, we, they just didn't know what that was. So it's possible, um, again, that Paul intended this passage to be about those who could be capable of being fulfilled or satisfied by heterosexual relations who are focusing on these like homosexual relations. And a side note on that, for those who know more about like kind of the general queer umbrella, there's bisexual people, pansexual, queer, and various other um, identifications or orientations that do involve more than one gender. And that's not the same thing here. So an example would be like, if I clearly, like I'm not, I'm queer, but like if I was more straight um, and I've just primarily had straight relationships and whatnot, and if I'm satisfied in a relationship and like out of my own lust and desires for more, I sought out a woman or a non-binary person. That I think is like a maybe present day equation of that. Like there's just more that I'm not being satisfied by here. Um, and again, like the most common forms of same-sex behavior in the Greco-Roman world is pederast pederasty, prostitution, and then like sex with masters with their slaves, um, which again has that power and balance um, that we see in pedastry. Okay, just checking my time here. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, we have another passage. So don't you know that God, that people who are unjust won't inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived. Those who are sexually immoral, uh, those who worship false gods, adulterers, both participants in same-sex intercourse, thieves, the greedy, drunks, abusive people, and swindlers won't inherit God's kingdom. And I put in parentheses some of the Greek that we're going to talk about here. Um, I'm also gonna read our first Timothy passage because that um, has that same problem of Greek, trans or Greek mistranslation. Um, so first Timothy one, nine through 11, we understand this, the law isn't established for a righteous person, but for people who live without laws and without obeying any authority. They are the ungodly and the sinners. They are people who are not spiritual, and nothing is sacred to them. They kill their fathers and mothers and murder others. They are people who are sexually unfaithful and people who have intercourse with the same sex. They are kidnappers, liars, individuals who give false testimonies in court and those who do anything else that is opposed to sound teaching. Sound teaching agrees with this, with the glorious gospel of the blessed God that has been trusted to me. And again, we have um, that Greek word there. Um, so, Malakoi and Arsenokoitai um, are at the heart of the issue here. Uh, we'll talk about what they mean, but originally in the KJV, Malakoi was translated to be more or less effeminate or um, soft is the, more of the true meaning here in the second bullet point. And Arsenokoitai sorry, <laughs> was translated as like mankind or so. Um, so first looking at Malakoi, that's meaning soft, and we go back to the gender complementarianism where men are need to need to be seen as strong, powerful, uh, 
and just leaders and capable beings. And when Malakoy is used uh, with the male gender, um, it's more like a derogative term because it's comparing them um, and the behavior of women as we see in the second bullet point. So, and this like somewhat graphic, but the actual active intercourse with male to male is penetration. So particularly the man who was being penetrated, uh, he was considered the one to be soft or to be the one behaving as the woman here. And that's where um, that like, uh, that yeah, derogative term comes for there, I guess. Um, Vines describes it as men succumbing to the charms of women. Uh, and then Arsena Kotoi, I don't think I'm saying that right. Arsena Koitai um, has a little bit more to it. Um, it comes from two component words, arson in Greek meaning male and koites meaning bed and has like a sexual uh, connotation to that. But Vines talks about how uh, just like the two components of the word don't actually make the meaning of the new word. Um, he uses the word understanding as an example. So if we broke that up to under understanding, that's not the same thing as understanding, right? So under is like we are under something, standing, you're standing up, but understanding has to do with intellectual knowledge and a grasping of the concept, not standing under something, right? Uh, we also have to deal with the fact that this word is quite rare in ancient Greek. Um, and possibly Paul was linking that up to those two kind of parts of the words that have been used around um, Leviticus 20, uh, but that was, yeah, and that was also used around like pedestrian prostitution and sex between masters and slaves. Um, and Philo, who we mentioned earlier, he described pedestrian as just uh, males with males because that was such a common thing to happen um, that if you said that in that time frame, people would understood that to be pedestrian, not a committed partnership of men sleeping with each other. Um, so we're assuming, or I guess Vines is assuming that there's a connection there and that is perhaps where he got that word. When we look further at the word, um, there's some writings in ancient Greek that come out after the fact here and we're trying to use context to figure out what this means. Again, like with that understanding word, um, if we just have the word understanding and we never use it again, we might not know exactly what that means. So we're using that repeated use of the word to help us understand the word itself. Um, and so this word, Arsena Koitai, uh, it just has very few examples that we have to use the other context to be able to figure out what the word itself actually means. So, and all of these uh, different uh, writings throughout ancient Greece or in ancient Greek, um, a lot of them can use the word in connection with injustices, economic exploitation, um, like thieving, plundering, defrauding, things like that. But it is very clearly absent in some of the same documents that talk about sexual vices or sins. And so having that word, arsena koitai, in sections of the same document about injustice or economic exploitation, but not in sexual sins, makes a very distinct, like, it's distinctive in its definition, because if it was about sexual uh, sins or vices, then it should be in that sexual vices section. Like, we should be able to see it there. Uh, let me see if I can go back to the... Okay, so in the first Corinthians passage, you see, um, I'll just read this. So 9a, I guess that second sentence in there. Those who are sexually immoral, those who worship false gods, adulterers, both participants in same-sex intercourse, thieves, the greedy, drunks, abusive people, and swindlers won't inherit God's kingdom. So Vines is seeing that this word, uh, arsenicatoy, is possibly a transition into talking about thieves, the greedy, and the drunks versus sticking with um, 
like kind of sexual immorality that we're seeing earlier in the passage. Okay, so I know that was super fast. Um, I have my bibliography here. I would definitely, definitely recommend this. He does a way better job of explaining everything that I did and kind of takes each one chapter. Um, is my like video still up? Can you see if I hold this book up? Okay, so this is the book. Um, I can't see myself, so I hope you can see me. Um, I would highly recommend it. He goes through each, um, verse chapter by chapter it talks about it way more depth than I could I just gave a brief overview introduction to it um, let me go to my next slide um, here are some more resources so again I have God and the Gay Christian by Matthew Vines that's more or less who we looked through today uh, if you're interested in even further discussion on the these passages passages in particular, I would do Unclobber by Colby Martin. These are also on Amazon. They're on um, Kindle if you have that. Um, if you really want and don't want to buy Matthew Vines, I mean, I have the physical copy and I can make PDFs if you want. <laughs> um, most of the rest of these I have on my Kindle, so that's harder to do. Uh, the Bible, Gender Sexuality by James V. Bronston. This one is a much more academic read if you're interested in that. And he also looks at um, the non-affirming and the affirming side. Um, I think he's from like Holland, Michigan, I think. And his son had come out as gay at one point. And so he wanted to go into this further. And he just all assumptions. He really puts it together really well. So that one is much more in depth. I would say that Matthew Vine's book is probably an introductory book, um, but the John's and the Brownson book is, is really where it's at. Um, then we also have queer theology. If perhaps you want to move further along um, in your studies and want to see how queerness and theology merge together. Um, that would be a good one there. Uh, the Lines um, by me, Kim Court. I think that's about like art. Um, it's kind of talking about like living out your faith and your sexuality kind of together as they do have a, a, a good impact on each other. And then Torn by Justin Lee. I'd probably compare that to Unclobber and God the Gay Christian in terms of um, introductory level and things like that. Um, we have here four out of the six of them are Christian based. Um, the gaychristian.net uh, one that's we get. So the, the GLAD site, um, that one kind of talks about the Gay Christian Network. And so you can look in there. And then the Trevor Project, because uh, just with this topic, suicide rate with queer folks, especially teenagers and young adults, is exceptionally high. So if that is a concern for any of you, if that's a concern for the church, um, a highly like powerful resource there. Um, they do so much like suicide prevention for the LGBTQ community and specifically teenagers and young adults. So I, I recommend that one at uh, the Reformation Project is, or I think was created by Matthew Vines, um, the author that we really spent time in today. So if you wanna kind of follow his train of thought, that's a good place to start as well. So I think I'll stop sharing and we can get to questions. Oh, thank you so much, Rain. That's you, you made it. <laughs> we me time, but you cover lots of content. Yeah, and we will share yes. the slides of the world and also resources. Yeah, so I will. Yes. and that was very much like get the book. Um, that was just picking out the highlights with 20 minutes to go over six passages. Yes, yeah, so I will stop the recording so we can to feel free to discuss or share your opinion.